We will start with the next Silver Jubilee lecture. The topic for this lecture is the feminization of agriculture, drivers and constraints. This lecture will be chaired by Antara Dev Sen, editor of the Little Magazine, New Delhi. Can I request the chairperson to please come on stage? This lecture will be delivered by Janine Rogers, Senior Visiting Fellow, Institute for Human Development, New Delhi. Can I also request our speaker to come on stage? Good afternoon, friends and, and ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a privilege to be here celebrating 25 years of R3. And it's a particular privilege for me to be here because this conference is in memory of Arvind Das, who I was fortunate enough to know as a friend. Um, we are already running a little late, so we'll go directly to Dr. Janine Rogers. Um, Dr. Rogers is a, a distinguished development economist who has specialized in gender and labor market. Um, she has been coming to India since the 1970s and studying rural Bihar. She has held uh, important posts in international organizations like the ILO. Today she will be speaking on the feminization of agriculture. Dr. Rogers. Thank you, Madam, uh, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Let me first uh, thank Adri for uh, inviting me to participate in this research conference on Bihar and Jharkhand. My research on Bihar has spread over several decades, and I'm indebted to many people for sharing their knowledge and uh, providing, providing uh, advice. I would like to mention a few. The late Professor Prada Narishankar Prasad, who jointly with my husband Jerry Rogers, set up in 1980 a project on the dynamics of poverty and employment in Bihar, which covered 36 villages in six districts of the plains of Bihar. In this context of this project, uh, I got the privilege to collaborate with Dr. Shabat Gupta, Member Secretary Adri and Professor Alak Sharma, Director of the Institute for Human Development in Delhi. The same 36 villages were resurveyed by IHD in 1998 2000 and again in 2009 11. And the empirical evidence that I will present on the feminization of agriculture is mainly drawn from, drawn from these three surveys. But I will start by presenting a couple of slides to place Bihar in the national context of feminization of agriculture. The feminization of agriculture is a catchphrase that refers to the rise in the share of women in the agricultural labor force. It is a worldwide phenomenon, but there are considerable variations across regions, between countries, and within countries. And these variations stem from differences in agroclimatic characteristics, as well as from differences in social and economic setups. Two main processes tend to trigger feminization. The first, and the one I'm going to deal with, is the struct structural transformation of an economy when labor moves from agriculture towards secondary and tertiary activities. Men are the first to shift because they are better placed to take advantage of the opportunities, while women are less mobile due to their care responsibilities and social norms. The second process is the growth of agro-exports. In India, the structural transformation of employment has been rather slow, and by 2011-12, 59% of rural male workers 
and 75% of rural female workers were engaged in agriculture and allied activities. The first slide that I sh uh, show is the share of women in each category of agricultural employment as recorded in the last four censuses at the national level. The blue bars refer to cultivators, the red ones to agriculture laborers, and the green ones to the agriculture workforce as a whole. The share of women among agricultural laborers is higher than their share among cultivators. And in both categories, the share increased between 1981 and 2001 and decreased thereafter. But the increase has been sharper and the decrease smaller for female cultivators than for female agricultural laborers. Women and entering into cultivation replaced male workers who left cultivation, but also made a net addition to the activity. And in 2011, women accounted for 37% of the agricultural workforce. The second slide gives the proportion of individual land holding area operated by women in the major states of India as recorded in the 1995-96 and 2010-11 agricultural censuses. Marked differences exist between states. In 1995-96, the women's share <coughs> varied between 0.5% in Punjab and 17.9% in Kerala and the national average was 7.7%. Between the two censuses, the proportion of area operated by we, women increased in all states except Kerala and West Bengal, and the national average rose to 10.9%. Andhra Pradesh and Bihar recorded the biggest increases. In Bihar, the share doubled, and Initially, it was below the national average, and in 2010-11, it was above. Therefore, the evidence from these two first slides points to a pro process of feminization of agriculture, at least until the mid-2000. NSS data showed an absolute <coughs> decline in the number of workers engaged in agriculture and related activities in the second part of the 2000 decade, and a, decli a strongest decline among female self-employed. But the analysis of uh, the feminization of agriculture faces several challenges. The first one is that the current agrarian, ag agrarian crisis and the rise in the cost of cultivation affect regions and categories of workers differently. For example, the situation of female agricultural laborers working in a BT cotton field in Maharashtra, that of the widow of a Punjabi farmer who committed suicide, or that of a Bihari woman de facto head of a farming household where male members migrate result from different processes. A second challenge concerns the reliability of national data. Both the census and the NSS are not very good at measuring two variables relevant to the analysis of the feminization of agriculture. One is male migration and the other one is uh, women's work. In the case of migration, both the census and the NSS have a bias towards long-term and permanent migration and missed out, miss out a um, significant proportion of short-term and circular migration. Regarding women's work, we know that the result of the 66th round of NSS showing a sharp decline in female labor force participation stirred a heated debate that I will not enter here, but I will just take the example of Bihar. It so happened that in 2009-10, NSS data was collected at the same time that data was collected by IHD in the 36 villages of Bihar I mentioned in my introduction. According to NSS, 
Female labor force participation rate in rural Bihar was abysmally low, 10.6% for usual status combining principal and subsidiary statuses. In contrast, the IHD survey reported a female labor force participation rate of 37 when unpaid family workers were excluded and 64% when they were included. Anybody used to work, walk around Bihar villages would have some reservations about the accuracy of NSS data. And as Professor Tendulka has pointed out, macroanalysis is required to analyze in depth specific dimension of women's work that NSS fails to capture. So now I will focus on Bihar. What is the what is the context of feminization of agriculture in Bihar? Population pressure on land is very high, and the average size of holding is one of the lowest in India and decreasing. The growth of the Bihar economy, sluggish until the 2000 decade, has been unable to create enough employment opportunities to absorb the surplus labor spilling over from villages Every year, millions of men leave Bihar and go to work for shorter or longer periods in other states while their spouses and children remain behind in their villages of origin. As we have heard during this conference, migration is not a new phenomenon in Bihar. The vagaries of the weather have always pushed Bihari men to search for supplementary income at the time of drought or flood. But the phenomenon has scaled up considerably since the mid-1980s. The push factor have been, as mentioned, population pressure on land and the stagnant agricultural production in Bihar. The pull factors have been the demand for labor in Punjab and Haryana, where agriculture was booming, and later the urban expansion and economic dynamism of Western and South uh, India. The next uh, slide summarizes the characteristic of migration for work from Bihar. Migration for work is almost exclusively male. Over time, it has steadily increased and the duration lengthened. In 1981, only 17% of the household and migrant members by 2008, the proportion had risen to 58%. This means that almost one male worker in two, aged 15 to 59, was a migrant. The duration of migration is determined by the type of employment migrants secure outside their villages and the activities they continue to undertake in the village. In 2008, 6% eight, eight, of migrants went away for a period of up to three months, 43% between three and eight months, and 51% for more than eight months, and permanent migration was relatively low. The incidence of migration varies widely across villages. The number of households with a, at least one male, <coughs> male migrant varied from 26 to 85% of the uh, village households. Differences in the incidence of migration are explained by regional and village uh, characteristics in terms of population density, cropping patterns, land holding, occupational structure, caste and class composition. It is higher in the less advanced districts of North Bihar. Migration is also explained by the characteristic of individual households. Migrants are found among all household categories, but its incidence tends to be higher towards each end of the land holding distribution. <coughs> the scale of migration has had an impact on many dimensions of social and economic life. It has had consequences for individuals, families, gender relations, the labor market, and agriculture development. The massive migration of male labor has, in particular, tightened local labor markets and contributed to higher participation of women in the labor force. 
The next slide presents the labor force participation rates of men and women aged 15 to 59 between 1981 and 2010. The figures take into account the combined primary and secondary economic activities of workers. Domestic work is excluded and activities of migrants and commuters outside the villages are included. The male labor force participation rate remain stable and at the same high level over time. But female labor force participation rose from 56% in 1981 to 58% in 1999 to 67% in 2009. This means that uh, women, women's participation increased by almost 20% over the 30 year period. Through migration, men were able to diversify their activities, but women's activities remained rooted in agriculture and animal husbandry. <clears throat> what were the determinants of this increase in female labor force participation? Many factors interact. Some tended to increase participation, while others tended to decrease it. Factors that tended to increase the demand for female labor include the shortage of male labor due to migration, an increase in agriculture productivity due to an increase in yields and cropping intensity, the introduction of new labor intensive crops such as vegetables, and the increase in animal husbandry. Other, <coughs> other factors tended to increase the supply of female labor, such as survival needs due to household crisis, a re reduction in the gender wage differential, which may be an incentive for women to enter the labor market, and changes in social norms. On the other hand, a third category of factors may, may decrease women's labor force participation, an education effect, girls staying longer in education, and an income effect derived from an increase in a household disponible income due to higher local wages and remittances from migrants. In Bihari villages, all the above factors have had played to lesser or greater extent, but male migration has been the major driver of change. Villages with a high proportion of migrants tend to have a high female labor force participation rate, as women have partly substituted for the migrant uh, male labor. The majority of uh, rural women work either as agricultural laborers or as self-employed on family land farms. They reported that after male migration, they had taken on new tasks. Previously, Casual laborers were primarily, primarily involved in harvesting. Now, a higher proportion than before report doing also transplanting and weeding. Women from, uh, from landowning or sharecropping household also oversee cultivation and get involved in farm management. Also, Bihar has experienced a substantial increase in milk as uh, animals, and now across all castes and classes, women devote a good part of their time to, uh, to animal husbandry, and in fact, women assume 70% of animal husbandry responsibility. So as we may guess, the structure of rural workforce has changed over time, and it has evolved differently for men and women. The graphic on the screen presents the change in the employment status of men and women workers between 2000 and 2010, both combining both primary and secondary activities. The most striking um, change in the structure of men's employment is the increase in the share of regular employment. The source of male regular employment is away from the villages and outside agri agriculture. An increase in regular male employment means that the migration period lengthens, and the consequence is for we women from land owning households to take over more farming responsibility. 
the structure of the women's employment showed a marked increase in self-employment. The progression of regular employment among uh, women is slow as opportunities outside agriculture are limited in villages. The relative decrease in casual employment is not only explained by the increase in self-employment, but also by an income effect. The next slide presents the female labor force participation rate by category of household. That is for the year 2009-10. Two graphs are presented side by side. Graph one on the left excludes unpaid family workers. Graph two on the right include them. And there are four categories of household from left to right agriculture laboring household not cultivating any land. The second category is agriculture laboring household cultivating. This means that there are marginal farmers who need to supplement their income with casual work. The third, the third category is small and medium farmers, and the fourth, big farmers. A distinction is made between primary activity in blue and primary and second activities combined in red. The vast majority of rural women declare domestic work as their primary activity. Only 14% have an economic primary activity, but the proportion rises to 37 when secondary activities are taken into account. Graph one on the left shows clearly that female labor force participation decreases as land ownership increases. But when unpaid family workers are included, as on uh, graph two, female, uh, female labor force participation is increases in uh, all categories of household, but more particularly in cultivating households. Although unpaid family workers and altogether unpaid family workers constitute two thirds of female rural self employment. And in oh sorry, I am skipping that one. <clears throat> the next uh, slide shows um, the, uh, the evolution of agricultural labor's wages. Wage structures in rural Bihar are complex. In the 1970s and 1980s, within a village, there were usually two dominant daily wages for casual agricultural laborers, one for men and one for women, alongside a harvest wage, which was a fixed share of the crop. Today, wages are more diverse and fluctuating. They are not always paid on a daily basis. Contract work is expand, expanding. And the wider range of crops and activities undertaken implies a correspondingly wider range of wage levels. Under the current context of the labor for a shortage, farmers compete for labor and try to secure labor through individual wage settings which uh, is uh, less uh, conducive to collective action. There is a marked sexual division of labor in agriculture, both in terms of activities and duration of the working day. Male migration has tightened the local labor markets and real daily wage for the agricultural labor force rose two to three times between 1981 and 2010. And there has also been some wage homogenization across the state. More variability is observed in women, uh, women's wage, wages than in men's wages. But the tendency has been for the gender wage gap to narrow in some villages. For example, in two Purnia villages, the gap with the, uh, which was in the range of 20 to 50% in 1999, has narrowed down to the range of 15 to 30% in 2009. At the whole state level, Usami, who using the wage rate for rural India from the Labor Bureau, estimated that uh, 
the female male ratio for transplanting had <coughs> fluctuated between 0.88 in 1999-2000 and 0.95 in 2010-11. So the evolution of uh, the wage gap hasn't been constant over time, nor has it followed the same pattern in different parts of the state. The table on the screen presents uh, the compound annual growth rates of real wages based on NSS data by sex and by subregion. In North Bihar, women's uh, wages grew faster than men's wages in the 1980s and 1990s. At that time, male migration grew, the demand for female labor increased, we observe a narrowing of the gender wage differential and an increase in female labor force participation. But the unabated increase in population, the stagnant agricultural production, and the lack of alternative job opportunities for women within villages has slowed down the progression, the progression of the female wages in the 2000 decade through a crowding effect. On the other hand, in South Bihar, women's wages grew faster than men's wages only after 2000. Crop diversification, the expansion of labor-intensive crops, such as vegetables, increased the demand for female labor and pushed up the wage of female-type agriculture operations in villages. Male migration was relatively low, but in the 2000 decade, the Bihar economy picked up and an increasing number of men were able to access better uh, paid employment outside agriculture by commuting to nearby towns when their villages were, uh, had good communication. So this was for the situation of the, uh, women in uh, the labor market, in the rural labor market. Now let us see what are the broader implications of the changes of the role of women in the behind rural economy. As agricultural producers, women still face many constraints. Firstly, compared to men, they have much poorer access, control, and ownership of productive resources. Resources are acquired through a variety of social relationships within the family, the market, the state and the community. Rules and social norms determine the principles of distribution and exchange of those resources and delineate the boundaries of choice of different categories of individuals. The control of assets is linked to structures of patriarchy and is mediated by caste and class hierarchies. Secondly, the access of women to public services irrigation management, extension services, training in new agriculture technologies, and credit remains limited. Land is a strategic resource. A woman who doesn't own land is not perceived as a farmer, but only as a subsidiary worker or helper. Without land, in her, nati in her name, a, women, women, a woman or farmers ability to take decisions, make investments in constraints. And Bina Agawal has showed that women with rights over land were more confident to participate in the development process. Access to land can be through inheritance, the market, or the state. In Bihar, the state has systematically sorry, the state has systematically um, excluded we, women from the land reform agenda, and there has been a lack of political will from among administrators to facilitate giving land to women. Though inheritance law have become more favorable uh, to women, for example, the revised Hindu Succession Act of 2005, they are poorly known and implemented. A Landesa study of 2013 found that in Bihar, only 5% of land plots have documents that include women's name, and only 7% of the women had plots titled under their name. 
The IGT survey found that uh, only 3.3% of households had land registered in the name of women. Female farmers have also been largely neglected by agriculture extension services. Over the years, agriculture extension has undergone some transformation. The traditional training and visit top-down system implemented in the 1970s was phased out in the late 90s, and subsequent reform efforts have aimed to establish a more pluralistic and demand-driven model of agriculture extension, which should be more favorable to women. But one, the current extension system is now guided by a variety of models, schemes, and institutions. The public sector continues to dominate and is largely male-dominated. The participation of female farmers is still limited in extension um, in extension-related meetings, and there is a lack of incentive for reaching female farmers. In 2006, the Institute for of Social and Economic Change in Bangalore and the Tata Institute for Social Sciences jointly conducted a study on gender and governance in rural services that covered agriculture, extension, and livestock services in Karnataka and Bihar. The results show, showed that 27% of male-headed far, uh, farming households had met with extension agents, but only 1% of female-headed farming. Access to livestock uh, services had fared a little better. This, the study also showed that the leadership of the farmers and dairy cooperatives was not inclusive with regard to either gender or caste, and the capture of the extension services by better off farming households disadvantaged female-headed households who, who tended to have pure sex. So there is a need to redesign extension services to reach women farmers, and um, by, by increasing female attendance in uh, agriculture institute and school. And also, there is a need to redesign, to redesign agriculture training curricula to include women's concerns. Let me now sum up. The last uh, 30 years have witnessed a feminization of agriculture and allied activity in Bihar. The main driver has been the out-migration and commuting of men in search of more remunerative non-farm activities. And consequently, women's workload has increased both inside and outside their home, and the shortage of local male labor has led to an increase in female labor force participation. The role of women in agriculture has increased, both as laborers and farm managers, the highest increase has been registered among self-employed women from uh, land-holding households, in particular from marginal and small um, landing, land holding. Women's agricultural laborers have diversified their agricultural activity, but an income effect leads some to reduce their labor market participation. Real agriculture wages rose two to three times before, between 1981 and 2010, and the importance of migrant remittances has steadily increased. But the feminization of agriculture entails more than numbers. It also refers to changes in processes and social norms. Social changes have occurred faster in villages with high male migration, Women are more mobile, more visible, have a, ha a bigger say in household affairs. They made some gains in the labor market, but as farmers, they continue to face specific challenges. They are lesser control over productive resources and lesser access to services constrain the growth of agri agricultural investment, innovation, and productivity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eugenine Rogers, for a very illuminating um, talk. Um, 
it is now open for questions. If I, I might well, sum up at the end. Yeah. How, how are you comfortable? Shall we take all the questions together, or maybe yeah. two questions or three questions? And three questions. Okay. Yes. <coughs> yes. This is. Thank you, Janine. That was uh, really informative and and helpful for all of us, I'm sure. Um, uh, a while back, I was supervising a PhD about um, female participation um, in agriculture projects itself in Nepal. Um, one of the things that we found very strongly was that, of course, not all women are the same in terms of their status in the family, and that we found that there was quite distinct patterns between whether they were mothers, whether they were first daughters, whether they were um, brides who come into the family as daughters-in-law, uh, and so on. So, um, and obviously that was more in the context of uh, joint families rather than nuclear, nucleated families. Um, so the question really is, I'm just interested in, as it were, disaggregation of the word woman um, in terms of the types of women by reference to their status in the family in terms of the types of participation in agriculture that you found. Okay. Uh, the gentleman there. Yes. Yes. Please, can, can somebody get, get the mic to him? No, I'll come to you later, perhaps. Here. Please, can you ha raise your hand further? You've Thank got the mic. You. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> land uh, is for cultivation, uh, Shani. Uh, instead of replacing uh, male labor by female labor, did you also collect information on land which has been taken out of cultivation? Okay, the third question in this slot, yes. Okay, uh, very well captured scenario of the uh, the status as well as economic and uh, social status of women as you pointed out with the data and all. I am wondering whether uh, in the evolution of their status, the healthcare system of women, particularly marginalized women, marginalized laborers also increased because the experiences that male folk in the villages, they get the uh, health uh, care much easier by their own effort as well as the as well as by the family effort. But as far as the women are concerned, but the poor, poorer ones, do they get the same share of the health care? Can you can you rephrase it in okay, one fine. sentence, please? Uh, You're talking do, about health care. Health care. Okay. Do these women in uh, poor women in the villages who are gradually rising to become uh, laborers or landholders, whatever? Do they get the same type of health care to themselves by whatever effort compared the to men, their male folk? As the men. Okay, so shall we just answer this now? So, for the question of uh, Jeff's question, yeah, the situation within the family is important. And you know, Sonalde does uh, work on uh, showing that uh, uh, women, women in uh, nuclear family, uh, in uh, extended family, have uh, less autonomy, less decision making uh, power. But uh, our survey has shown that over the, um, uh, over the year, remittances are important when they reach normally uh, a specific member in the family. And when they reach the female, then that female status, uh, if it's a spouse of the migrant, for example, that the status of this uh, uh, woman increase. And also we have noticed that uh, there is a tendency to have more an in, uh, increasing proportion of nuclear family. So that, uh, and uh, we know, for example, in uh, one of the South, uh, uh, South uh, Bihar village we had, the head, it was a joint family, the head of the family who was a carpenter had an accident, 
and the, the, they were, the two sons were migrants, but the two daughters-in-law were living in. And when, after the death of the head of the family, uh, the family split in three households, and the uh, mother, widowed, had to work as an agricultural laborer because his, uh, the daughter-in-law didn't want to have a common kitchen, didn't want to have a... So it's important, but it seems that migration, there is a tendency to have, to split a uh, household in more nuclear family. Uh, for Jan, we didn't uh, look at, uh, for the land out of uh, cultivation. We haven't uh, had a, a more uh, increase in uh, more uh, question on to be able to uh, analyze that. We still have a lot of data, but we haven't uh, analyzed that. And uh, healthcare. Do women get the same healthcare as men? Um, it's, um, the healthcare women have been less uh, mobile. They were not taken very much out of uh, the villages for healthcare. And now it's uh, also the growth of private healthcare. And, uh, so it's, um, we haven't uh, data to compare directly. What we know is that migrant workers who have uh, disease while away from the villages, have a tendency to come back, and it's the village which support the reproduction of the labor force, while uh, at the cost of uh, them. Okay, the last set of questions. I have one, two, three, four hands up there. Uh, excuse me, <laughs> can't see. Hi. Yes. Um. Um, yeah. So the question is, uh, does the feminization of, um, uh, of, of this, these recent times, these decades that you're talking about, what effect has it had on uh, mechanization of agriculture? So how is feminization linked with mechanization? I was going to ask the same question. I just had a small question on the feminization of uh, the labor. Uh, do you have any idea of the total working hours per day? Has there been an increase in women's working hours per day? Total working hours. Total working hours. Because in terms of the unpaid care and domestic work that they are doing, when you add with agricultural work, is there an extension of their working day? Last question. Yes. Oh. Um, yeah, thank you for this uh, excellent, uh, excellent presentation. Um, I had two questions. One, um, I think the first one is, what I wanted to know was, did you any, also observe any externalities uh, of this, of the increasing labor force participation, uh, particularly linked to um, like the choice of how many kids you want to have, like basically the impact of labor force participation on, uh, on family size? Does it have does it have an impact on the family size? Is that the question? Yeah, uh, okay. uh, yeah, correct. That, okay. That and what's the second question? Um, and, the, and, and the second question was that you had uh, sort of uh, mentioned that much of the labor migration was um, was a product of like you know uh, of uh, of circumstance uh, because of uh, um, of of height of migration. Uh, could you just like you know was there? Can you attribute like what what proportion of the total migration was attributed towards um, what what proportion of this rise in female migration can be attributed towards migration versus other factors? Other factors uh, for migration, other than what? No, no. Um, so I think if I understood the presentation correctly, it said that labor force participation has been rising over time, and this is a product of circumstances because men have been migrating out and therefore women are now substituting in. Right. Is that the case for what percentage of the households is this the case? Is that the case for like all of the households or like half of them or you know one fourth? So and is migration the reason for the change in every case or a certain proportion of? 
Yeah. Uh, last question. Yes, thank you very much for a, a fascinating um, presentation. I just wanted to ask, and maybe it, it links on to an earlier question, about the changes in the amount of domestic labor that women are doing. Has there been any change in the amount of time spent in bringing water to the household, carrying out other tasks which women have traditionally done? Because if they're being asked to do more work uh, in the agricultural side, then there's enormous pressure on what they do every day, you know, providing fuel, you know, making cow dung cakes, all the things that women do in a rural setting. And I wondered if they're being caught with enormous pressure. Um, is the domestic side less than it was? Okay, all right. On mechanization, obviously, it's, uh, it has a mechanization effect the um, uh, activities of men within villages. You know, it's, it has been the power tiller and tractors, but the um, women's activities in villages, such as transplanting uh, and uh, weeding, hasn't been uh, affected. So, in fact, its mechanization has lightened the way of uh, uh, men's work. On, uh, I, I go on uh, the working day. It's a little bit the same question as, as the, last uh, the last one. Of course, it has uh, increased the uh, um, workload of women inside the household and outside the household. And you have in the literature, you have cases to show that productivity, it affects the productivity of uh, the women. Uh, now on uh, specific uh, activities within the household, one of the uh, remittances, the use of remittances, for example, has been the, to spend on uh, um, hand pump which facilitate the work of women to get uh, water. Because remittances have been mostly uh, spent on uh, consumption items or house repair and so on, but not on uh, productive investment uh, on the land. Um, what on uh, family size? Family size, does it affect the family size when women are working as a labor force or in, in the fields? But that is uh, what... Do they opt to have less children? I think that's the question. <laughs> there is a, um, a decline in fertility, but uh, fairly slow. Eh? There is, I think, perhaps the education is more, uh, uh, has a bigger impact. Eh? I would like to... Uh, add for the pattern of spending remittances and increase uh, uh, domestic uh, available disposable income. It's uh, it has been domestic uh, uh, consumption, health repair, and education of children for all caste, whether it's uh, higher caste or lower caste. The it's a priority spending. And I would like to uh, have, I didn't add it at the end, but I would like to stress for the future, the future of uh, the feminization of agriculture is uh, a bit, uh, there is a question mark, because there is a gap between the aspiration of a uh, population which is getting better educated and the availability of jobs. For uh, women, there are very little uh, employment within uh, the villages, and neither uh, women nor the young men which, uh, who are getting better educated want to stay in agriculture. They want to go out. So what uh, uh, in the, the, the future, for the future generation, it's a question. Okay, I think uh, we are already over, over our time limit. So I, although 
I did have one question. I don't want to uh, uh, go in for a <laughs> big thing. And I promise not to summarize or do anything. Just one small question. Is there any policy change that you see as, as I mean, uh, women are now 37%, you said, of the uh, agricultural workforce. Is there any uh, policy change? Is the, is the government in any way doing things like training women, like making women-centric policy? In short, is the, is, is the government ready to look at the woman as the protagonist of this story of agriculture? Or does she remain the farmer's wife? The major problem is that uh, uh, it's, we are in a depth agricultural crisis. And uh, this morning there was a talk that uh, uh, even in Bihar, quite a lot of cultivators have left cultivation. So uh, they, there is a, a stress on education of women, but not specific on uh, there are some. Uh, there is, for extension, they try to link uh, self-help group and extension services. The major problem is that uh, extension services are uh, short of staff, short of uh, resources. So it's not. It's not uh, helping much. Thank you very much, Dr. Rogers. Ten minutes for tea. Can I request everyone to get their tea and coffee to the table?